Zach Nielsen, welcome to the show. Thanks. Glad to be here. Uh, of course, Zach Nielsen is the son of Harry Nielsen, who, in my mind, is probably the greatest voice of the 20th century. He had number numerous hits. He was a great songwriter. He wrote songs for other bands. I know that, uh, of course, Three Dog Night had a hit with a song he wrote. If, is that correct? Yeah, that was uh, One is the Loneliest Number. And uh, actually, I always enjoyed Harry's version much more than the Three Dog Night version, which was the actual radio hit. But um, And of course, he uh, wrote song, uh, at least one song for the Monkees. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, that was way back in the early days before he even had a contract. He wrote uh, Cuddly Toy and the uh, Monkees picked that one up. And uh, I know that he also himself had some hits that he did not write, like things that people might be really familiar with, like Everybody's Talking or Talking. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, his two biggest hits were uh, written by other people. It's Everybody's Talking was one of them for Midnight Cowboy. And his most famous one was Without You. Uh, I Can't Live If Living Is Without You. That was written by uh, two members of Badfinger, Pete Hammond and Tom Evans. Well, what's what's funny is I, I must set up this whole thing, Zach. I want to talk to you for a long time because I'm such a huge Harry Nielsen fan, and of course we've been friends on Facebook for a while. We don't know each other very well, but I'm just impressed by by you. You seem such a, like a down to earth, level headed guy. But before I start asking you questions, I want to talk about your life and I want to talk about your father's life. I want to set up like how I got into your dad's music because I didn't really know who Harry Nielsen was until I was about 17 years old. I had a relative who their favorite, they grew up and they, and they saw The Point on television, which is a cartoon that I believe it was all your father's work. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it aired on TV, I think in January of 71. Something yeah. Like the, this relative of mine was born in 1970. And as a child, they remembered seeing it on TV and it made a big impression on it. It's, it's honestly one of my favorite albums that Harry did. And it's one of my favorite shows. My, my daughter and I watch The Point all the time. And I, I never get sick of the album. Let's do it over and over again. But they had um, they saw that and then they eventually came across in the 70s an eight track of, I believe, your your father's most, the, the top selling album was Nielsen Schmielsen. Yeah. And fast forward to the 90s and I'm 17 years old and, and they had this eight track still. And they were telling me, you know, I, I got to show you this. There's this eight track I have, and it was my favorite eight track growing up. And it was it was your dad's album, Harry Nielsen. I'd never heard of him at the time. And I was just fascinated. And I played it. I heard, it, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And yeah. then later on, you know, as I'm going through that transition from child to manhood, the 18 to 20 transition, you know, I had a lot of, you know, teenage angst and a lot of heartache and problems like a lot of people do when they're making that transition. And your dad's albums started being available more so in stores. At least I was finding them. I don't know if they're out of a print for a while and then they started putting them in print in the 90s. Yeah, but I yeah. just started listening to them and it was like therapy. I was like, this this man is brilliant. He, you know, he like he feels pain and he has emotions and he's funny and he's and it was like ther for years, your dad's albums were literally my therapy to help me get through the hard times. So Anyway, I, I just wanted to tell you that because that's just my own personal story. I actually met your father once as well. Oh, cool. It was a, it was a brief meeting. It was at the Beatle Fest, or it's called the Fest for Beatles fans in, in Chicago in yeah. Yeah, 1993. Yeah, Right, yeah. And I actually, he played a concert there. I was blown away, and I fell even more in love with him. And I met him in the elevator. We were going up, and he was just the friendliest guy, <laughs> funny and witty and so approachable. Yeah. So anyway, my first question, I guess, now that I kind of gave you the backdrop to my fandom of your father's, is what in the world, from your perspective, was it like having Harry Nielsen as a dad? Well, I can, uh, well, I'll tell you, Chad. Uh, I, I, first of all, I didn't actually live with him. And this is something I have to explain sometimes because uh, he and my mom uh, got divorced when I was about four. And so I went to live with my mom. So I didn't actually live with him. Uh, so I was kind of a part of his life peripherally, but he was generally very active in terms of communicating with me. And I went to see him a few times a year, usually. Um, and we hung out and, and all that good stuff. Uh, I, so I didn't live with him like literally on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, anyway, sometimes 
I just have to explain that. But uh, it was, you know, for the longest time, I was younger, and I I just thought of him as my dad. I I knew he was something, you know, I knew he, he went to recording studios, I knew he met famous people and hung out with them and stuff like that. But to me, whenever I was there visiting, he always took the time to just hang out with me, you know? He would do other things too. He would take me with him to the studio, but I was always a part of it. And I was really appreciated that even if I didn't fully understand it. Well, you know, I, you know, I can relate somewhat, obviously, you know, it's a different situation, but you know, I come from a divorced household and, you know, my relationship with my father was similar. I mean, I wasn't around him a lot, you know, later on, but the time that I had with him, I really appreciated. Now, what about being his son what about being a fan? How, I mean, that's to me kind of a kind of a strange thing to think about. Like, how, as as a, are you a fan of your dad? How about that? Is music? Yeah. yeah, I I may be biased. I may be slightly <laughs> biased. Um, I am though. Uh, well, I grew up with it. Uh, we were talking about the point earlier. You mentioned the point, and uh, when I was born uh, in January of seventy one, which I think is when the point aired, um, Harry was at the hospital when I was born, and then he went home and he finished painting my room, you know, the baby's room with scenes from the point all over the room. So, and I have pictures of this. He painted all of it, like the three fat sisters and the the rock man and all the characters from the film uh, all over the walls. And uh, of course I was too young really to understand it, but I always thought that was pretty amazing. Um, So was he, was he, that's, that is, (laughs) As a kid, I can't believe how cool that would be. Because as an adult, I think all those illustrations from the point are so awesome. I can't imagine as a child. Now, was he also an artist? Like as far as like painting and drawing? I never I never heard that before. Not really. He wouldn't he wouldn't claim to be one, but he was halfway decent at it. It, it more sketchy. But you know, honestly, the uh the, the stuff that he did on the walls was not bad. It looked a lot like the uh the characters from the film and he got the colors right too. So well, I was he, pretty impressed. Was he was he involved at all in the illustrations in the film? The point? I'm you know I'm honestly not sure how much he was involved in that. I, uh, the studio he worked with uh, handled all the animation. I'm not sure if he actually gave them sketches or whether they just sort of did their own thing and he approved it. But uh, I'm, I'm assuming at some point he gave them some kind of sketches because he could at least sketch them out. Because that that entire film was ba- it was his baby. I mean, like everything from the the songs, obviously, but the story itself was written by him. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, he wrote everything, the story and all the music. Well, I I encourage any of my listeners to check out the point, both the movie, which you can find on DVD and probably on digital. Everything's on digital now, and yeah. also the album. Like I literally like I, I can put the album in and just put repeat on. And I never get sick of it. Like sometimes my wife has to tell me to put something different in because it's just one of those albums. Yeah, I know the feeling. I do the same thing sometimes. It's a great album. But speaking of which, what what are your favorite albums that that your father Harry Nielsen did? Oh, getting into the tough questions, huh? All right. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I, I'm I, like I said, I'm biased. I'm such a huge fan of the music that he did that it's hard for me to name a specific favorite. Um, I like all of his early stuff. I like Nilsson Schmilson, which is his you know breakthrough album. Uh, and I like all the stuff he did after that, too. It's hard for me to name a favorite. It's hard for me to name a favorite song, too. Uh, when people ask me what my favorite Nilsson song is, I generally say it's uh, Without Her, not Without You. It's Without Her is a different one. Yeah, no, that's a great song. You know, I can, you know, I, I have a hard time sometimes narrowing down any band or any artist that I like my favorite. You know, I, I like so many different types of music and so many different styles and songs and artists. But as far as Harry Nielsen goes, you know, I like it all. But the albums that I can say affected my life the most is what I kind of look at. And obviously, you know, Nielsen Schmielsen, but also too, you know, the albums, the album Pussycats was oh, yeah. really an album that touched my life. Some of the, you know, I know that he had injured his voice while recording that, and you may have more insight on that, but I always thought that the vocals on that with his injured voice were absolutely hauntingly beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, he still managed to pull that off. What what happened was uh, that album was produced by John Lennon, and uh, the two of them 
were basically recording this album and it was always a competition between those two guys. They, they competed with each other. It was kind of like brothers, you know, it's always got to, one of them's always got to prove he's better than the other one. So that's what happened. Harry didn't, Harry's not a screamer, you know, he's not, he, when he sings, he's got a very delicate voice, but John Lennon is a screamer. <laughs> right. And, and so, and you can hear it on the album, some of the tracks, that's what he was doing. He was screaming instead of singing like he normally does. And he actually ruptured his vocal cords. Um, there is a, the, the famous quote from those sessions is there was blood on the microphone. Um, and you, you can hear the, the roughness of his voice on some of the tracks. And I don't know how he managed to get some of those tracks sounding so good though. <laughs> like you were saying, some of them sound pretty amazing, uh, even with an injured voice. It just absolutely, I always found it beautiful. And, and when I first heard the album, I didn't realize this backstory about his voice on the album, but I was always attracted to it. There was some sort of just rough brilliance behind his voice, and I never knew till later what it was. And another album that really, really, really affected my life in a positive way was when I discovered it was K. Nielsen. That's how you pronounce it, right? Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and for those who don't know, it's a, it's an album that's it's spelled... Um, I'm probably going to get this wrong. It's K N N I L L S S O N N because Harry was tired of people misspelling his last name. So he just, he just went all out and named his album like the worst possible misspelling ever. Um, well, the, yeah. the, and I heard that story and I always thought it was hilarious. I actually, you know, one more thing about the album that I want to do a little tie into that, the name being spelled wrong. But I will say that, the album, Kenielsen, you know, I, I just anybody that wants to discover um, good music, no matter what they're into, that album is just, it's just gorgeous. And it's much different style musically than a lot of Harry's other albums. Do you have any insight on that? Why it was so different or how it was different? Uh, not, I don't have too much specific insight, but this is from his later period. This was uh, 1977, I think, Kenielsen. And uh, he was fighting with RCA, and RCA wasn't uh, supporting him very well. And unfortunately, this album was released right when Elvis died. Right. And uh, there was no promotion for it whatsoever. And so he was just kind of doing his own thing. He had already kind of fired producers, and I think he produced this one himself. Um, so for better or for worse, he was, he was uh, blazing his own path at this point. And uh, so it's a little bit different. But he was, like always, he did what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. And basically nobody could stop him. <laughs> and I think that's what, what part of being a brilliant artist is. You know, I think that the yeah. artists who have that mentality make the best art. Um, and I love that album, but I love all of his albums. But those are, those are ones that, you know, probably affected me the most, even though, you know, I, I've got the library, you know, and I, and I switch it out and listen to all different ones and, you know, if I have one goal about talking about Harry Nielsen, I think I find a lot of people, a lot of fans are like this. If there's one goal, it's always the, to turn people on to Harry because it's like, it's an amazing process because it's amazing how somebody could be so talented, so successful, and yet there, if you'll talk to some people who've never heard of him. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people attribute that to the fact that Harry never toured. Oh. Um, he's, he's kind of unique in that sense. He, he still made it pretty big. He won two Grammys. Um, Without You is a song that almost everyone on the planet has heard of. And and he, nobody knows who he is. It's really interesting. And he didn't tour because, well, there's a lot of theories, but uh, our theory is that he was, basically he had stage fright and he said he doesn't like checking in on a clock. Like he doesn't, he doesn't like people telling him when to go on stage and perform. He doesn't like being that kind of trained monkey kind of thing. So he just didn't do it. Um, he, he did two BBC specials, and normally there's a live audience for those when at the time. And he insisted that there was no live audience for the ones that he did. So they actually spliced in stock footage of an audience. Really? I never. And, knew, I've and, seen them, and I, I love them. They're awesome. But no, I never knew that. Yeah, it was a completely empty studio basically when he did those. Well, you know, you know, I think we all, you know, he was living the dream. I think we all want to come and go and do what we want and don't want to clock in. I think it's human nature. So, but he was able to do it. Um, yeah, he, he just wrote his own ticket, essentially. Now, when I saw him, you know, in Chicago, 
at the fest for Beatle fans. It was 1993, so it was short before he passed. He, he, you know, he was doing concerts there, but I think that, and I could be wrong, and I don't know if you ever talked to your, your dad about um, his involvement with Beatle Fest, as it was called back then, but he seemed like he, it was, it was like a family atmosphere for him. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, he, you know, he performed multiple nights there, and, and, and but everybody knew Harry, everybody loved Harry. It was like he was just one of the the people that were there. You know, everybody he, you could approach him, you could talk to him. Now, I assume, you know, it was a similar similar way with his other fans in different situations, but I don't know. Maybe you know. Yeah, um, he loved that. Um, he he was kind of a, a private person. You know, like I said, he didn't tour. So he didn't get burned out like people on tour always do. You know, when people are on tour all the time and they do meet and greets, they're tired. They're exhausted. They play every night, you know, and he never had that. He never did that. So he never had that audience interaction. So every time anybody came up to him and said, oh, I love your album this, or I love this song this, he loved that. He didn't get that all the time. So what you experienced and what I've heard from a lot of other people is, is basically exactly what you said. He was, he's very friendly and personable because he wanted to hear from you. He wanted to know what you thought about his life's work. Um, and of course, in 93, he was pretty sick at that point. Um, and and he, he wanted even more to know <laughs> how people thought uh, his career went, you know? Well, you know, I and looking back and, and now knowing some of the history of his health as he passed too early as in 1994, correct? Yeah. You know, I didn't know then that he wasn't well, but I tell you what, he was phenomenal in his performance and he was phenomenal as, you know, himself after his performance. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he was, I never would have known his struggle. But, you know, one thing that I wanted to mention to you um, on a kind of a different note, going back to what I found was humorous. We all do about the, the Nielsen album, which was, you know, it named that in response because nobody could spell Nielsen and it's spelled N I L S S O N. Um, right. Well, the funny thing is, is that about 21 years ago, I had a child and. It was on the tail end of, you know, me discovering Harry Nielsen and, and Harry Nielsen's music helped me so much in so many trials. And my my wife and I, she, you know, she became pregnant. We found out we're having a boy and she's, you know, what do you want to name him? Do you want to name him Chad Jr.? And I said, there's no way. I know what we're naming our son. It's Nielsen. And it's being, oh, we're going to spell it like Harry Nielsen, N-I-L-S-S-O-N. And That's uh, cool. my son's name is Nielsen. That's great. And uh, That's great. I actually, um, uh, somebody we, we might know in common, but Curtis Armstrong. Oh, yeah. Uh, who played Booger on Revenge of the Nerds. And yeah, um, was, I believe, Nielsen for a fan. while, the president of the Harry Nielsen fan club. Is that correct? Uh, that I'm not sure about, but but he is definitely one of the world's biggest Nielsen fans, for well, sure. I believe when I, because well, I was going to say, I, I actually um, interviewed Curtis Armstrong about 20 years ago. And oh, wow. he, I think at the time he said at that time he was the president of the fan club, which I don't even know what that meant because that was right before the internet was too involved in things. And I didn't know, you know, there wasn't a lot of information out there about stuff like that. But I told him, I, my son was about one at the time. And I told him that I named my, because I didn't know he knew who Harry Nielsen was. And he didn't know who I, I knew who Harry Nielsen was. We we're just interviewing him because you know, he was Booger from Revenge of the Nerds. And right. somehow we got on the topic of Harry Nielsen. He was blown away that I um, named my son Nielsen. And he actually uh, wrote something up in the fan, it's like the fa the Harry Nielsen fan club newsletter. He actually wrote a story about it. Oh, that's cool. So anyway. Um, that's really cool. There's another story that's a little bit like yours. Um, Harry uh, lived next door to Nikki Six from Motley Crue <laughs> um, for a little while. And they become great friends, like really good friends. They would hang out with each other all the time. And Nikki had a, a son and named him Decker Nilsson Six uh, after my dad. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So his, uh, his middle name is Nilsson. I never I, knew that. And I never knew that your dad and Nikki Six <laughs> knew each other. Yeah, yeah, kind of unlikely, right? But they were neighbors, uh, and it's just how it worked out. Harry was friends with all his neighbors all the time. 
Wow. Um, now that yeah, is so, the, and, yeah. oh, I'm so glad I <laughs> right. got you on the show. Like that's a story that I've never heard. And I don't think I ever would have heard it otherwise. And he loved that too. He loved the fact that, that Nikki named his son that. Well, I think that like, you know, that's like a testament to your dad's talent and how he touched people's lives. Yeah. I think that, you know, the difference between Harry Nielsen in my mind and a lot of different artists is that, you know, you, you can hear songs and they're good songs. But Harry's songs tend to be on a deeper level, I feel. Yeah. And I think they affect people emotionally on a stronger level than a lot of music does. And uh, I always appreciate your father for that. I do have a question, too, about... His, well, actually, I, I kind of know the story about his involvement with some of the members of the Beatles, because obviously, you know, I'm a fan of the Beatles and most people are. Yeah. And of course, there's that story, which maybe you could tell better about how, you know, the Beatles talked about your dad originally. Oh, yeah, yeah. The uh, the press conference. Yeah, they were asked who their favorite group was. And John said, Nilsson, <laughs> because the Beatles were like that in press conferences. But then Paul also said, Nilsson. Uh, so that was that was after uh, their their manager had, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, their manager had given them copies of, of one of Harry's albums at the time. Yeah, and, that's uh, the story that I heard that he was blown away by Harry and he gave him to the Beatles and they loved it. Um, yeah. And then him and, and then, because what happened then after that, and you may know more about it, I, I believe him and John became friends. Yeah, uh, one, it was shortly after that, and John actually called Harry, and Harry told the story like I was just sitting in a hotel room and the phone rang and it was John Lennon. Wow. <laughs> it's just like one of those things. Wow. And then Paul called him later that day. Um, and, and yeah, that's how it got started. And then they just became friends after that. And then I heard the, I, <laughs> then I heard the, the line in a Harry Nielsen interview where he said, but I was expecting Ringo to call it. He never called. Right. Yep. But then, but, <laughs> <laughs> but but then he became best friends with Ringo. Right, because yeah. because when your dad remarried later on, wasn't he the best man? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, he was. And they also made Ringo Starr and your dad, Harry Nielsen, made a movie together, correct? Yeah, that was a... Uh, you don't want to talk about that. I don't know too much about it. I don't either. <laughs> Honestly, I've never seen it because you can't find it. It's a little it, obscure. Like. Yeah, Son of Dracula. Um, it is... Not good, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> it is what it is, though. I mean, uh, the uh, uh, Harry also did music for um, another movie. Oh, I shouldn't have started talking about it because now I can't remember the name of it. Well, he did it for but Popeye. He, yeah, he did for Popeye. That was one of the ones that he wrote uh, all the music for. Um, he also did that for another movie where he actually wrote the end credits and sang them. Oh, yeah, he sang it was, the end um, credits it for was, them. Didn't it come out in the 90s before he, before he died? Uh, it was it was before that. It was in the seventies, I think. Okay, maybe I'm but, thinking of something else. The Fisher King. What is it called? The oh, the Fisher King. Yeah, that he. Yeah, and that's an interesting one for me because I was actually there when he recorded that. Um, that was for yeah, the Fisher King. He recorded. How about you? Uh, the song is, I like New York in June. How about you? And that was the uh, the credits song for uh, the Fisher King, which is a Terry Gilliam movie. So he told me he was going to London to record this, and I asked if I could go with him. And he said, sure. So I, I met him in London, and I was there with him for a week and a half, almost two weeks. And uh, I was there at Abbey Road when he recorded that. I was right there in the room with him. Well, not in the booth with him, but, you know, it was great. Because uh, I didn't get the chance to do that that often, because, like I said, I didn't actually live with him. So for me, that was really special, and I got to hang out with him a lot, and we had a lot of uh, a lot of good talks. That was in '91, so I was 20 years old at that point. I could actually talk with him like an adult, and uh, we had some great conversations, and we met some really interesting people, um, and it was just amazing. I got to see him perform, which really was amazing. I mean, even even in '91, when he was he had already gotten sick at that point, he was having heart problems, and uh, just just amazing he'd just get into the booth and just do it it was crazy <laughs> I, mean, I don't think i've ever seen anything like it well i can't imagine what that would have been like i mean not only as a fan but as is you know a father and a son now was that the last thing he recorded uh it wasn't the very last thing he recorded it was the last thing he recorded i think for somebody else like for for a movie soundtrack or something like that he had been working on another album when he died 
which he didn't finish. He had recorded uh, demos for almost all the tracks on the album, but never completely finished. His relationship with, you know, some of the the Beatles, you know, um, one of the questions I had about that particular subject matter is I know that, you know, he was friends with John and he obviously he was, you know, I think loosely friends with them all. But what I found fascinating, what I was, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, um, about yourself is I know that, that you're dealing with health issues. Um, and I'd like to talk about that, but also like, I know that Paul McCartney had sent you a letter recently and I thought that was so cool. But yeah. Why don't you explain what's going on with your health situation and in that story with Paul as well? Oh yeah. Um, I was di- diagnosed with the uh, stage four colon cancer. Um, so I, I'm okay. I'm doing chemotherapy. I had surgery already. I'm going to need another surgery at some point. Um, and the, the cancer is shrinking and going down. My prognosis is good. Colon cancer is fairly treatable. It's a high success rate. So uh, I don't feel too bad right now. When I get chemo, I feel bad for a little while. But that's basically it with me. I'm, I'm just, I've got cancer. So I'm, we're working on killing it. And, uh, and that's, that's my, <laughs> that's my health issue. Uh, but Paul McCartney heard about my cancer uh, through a mutual friend of ours. And uh, he wrote me a letter. It was typed, but he, he sent it to me, uh, wishing me well. And, and that he told me that his wife had cancer and went through chemotherapy too. So he's familiar with the process and, and what it does to you and all that. And it was uh, amazing, frankly, because I have never actually met Paul. Um, I've met George. I've met Ringo a few times. Um, I haven't met Paul in person. We knew of each other. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't know Paul? But but uh, he knew kind of who I was because he was friends with Harry too. And so he sent me this letter out of the blue. I didn't know it was coming and it was amazing. Uh, he, uh, just the fact that he cared for my, my well-being and, and wished me luck with my chemo is really amazing and just goes to show why he was friends with Harry. He's a decent guy. Yeah, I know. I, when I saw, because I saw about that on Facebook that he had sent you that and I, and I was just so blown away. Like I sent, I shared the post with my, with my son, just like, look how cool this is. I mean, you know, one thing that, you know, obviously I think once again, you know, the fact that Paul sent you that letter is a testament to the impact that your father has on people. But also too, what surprised me the most was not about like, you know, Harry impacting people, but, you know, I think Paul like sometimes gets a bad rap for being kind of cold. And that to me, I'm like, that is like, what, what a, a compassionate, caring, thoughtful move to send that to you. Um, and I was just, I was just thoroughly impressed. I don't know. I was blown away. I thought that was the coolest thing. So yeah. Me too. I was amazed. Now you do. I one the other thing I was going to say about you, Zach, and what I, from afar, you know, as I observed life around me, like I am impressed with your positive attitude about your health struggles. I mean, I've never seen you even mention a negative word or you know a pessimistic anything. You're always like, you're good. I'm fine. Everything's great. You know, you know. Obviously, you know you're dealing with what you're dealing with. But my whole point is, is that you're so positive about it, which is amazing. Well, thanks. Um, I, I feel like I have to be. Not not that it's a struggle or anything. I just this is what doctors tell me all the time. It's while I'm while I was in the hospital and recovering and stuff, they said mental attitude is a huge part of the healing process with anything, but also especially with cancer. Cancer can be very depressing uh, because some cancer is a lot harder to get over than others. Um, and they keep telling me that I have to stay positive and and be positive. And that's kind of my natural state anyway. So, uh, so what I'm doing is these, uh, these cancer that I'm just singing what I call mediocre karaoke and, uh, just posting it up, just singing and doing it. Because for one thing, it's physical. Singing is a physical activity. It helps me, uh, stretch my lungs and, and, uh, makes me stand up and do things and sweat a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's all good for me. But the other thing is that it keeps my spirits up because I love music. I'm sure everybody who listens to your show here loves music. And it's for those of us who love music, it's it's everything. So singing karaoke is is something that's cathartic for me. And so what I've done is just started calling them cancer rookies and just singing them. As long as I have cancer, I'm going to keep doing them. And uh, 
no no reason this they're not particularly good it's just i'm just doing it for 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 the sake of doing well you know i but i'll be honest with you like from afar i see you're 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 doing this and the 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 impression that i get there there is a rhyme or reason because honestly you know i think when people see somebody like yourself who has a health issue that you know you know it's not a cold it's not a flu it's something more serious than that you know and they you know it's almost like a, a defiant like i'm gonna live life and enjoy life and have fun and be it, it's almost like i think it's once again I'll, I'll use that word it's therapy it's like therapeutic for other people who are also struggling with health issues to see how you react to it and i think that's awesome now where can they see can can are you, are you posting these on youtube as well or where are you posting these yeah, um, you can follow me on Facebook or send me a friend request and then you'll see them on Facebook, but I'm also posting them on YouTube. I started a channel called Canceroki. So if you go on YouTube and just search for Canceroki, you'll see them. Uh, I'm also posting them on Twitter. Well, you mentioned that you're a fan of music and I, and I figured you were, you know. Besides your father, like what are some of your the bands that you're into in general or right now or, or some of your favorite bands? Like what sort of music do you like? Oh man, um, the list is endless. Um, <laughs> you know, everybody has their favorite stuff. I try to be as open-minded as I can with music because I found over the years that I can find music that I like in almost any genre of music, yes. almost anything. There's always something that to like in there. So as a sort of journey of discovery, I've, I've found that I like almost all different kinds of music just because there's always an artist or a song that I like in that genre. So I, I was kind of a child of the eighties. I mean, I was born in the seventies, but the eighties is when I started listening to my own music, you know, turning into the radio and uh, listening to the top 40. So I am kind of, uh, kind of a huge fan of the eighties, uh, popular music in the eighties. Well, you know, that's one of my big categories. You know, I mean, I'm similar. I was born in 76 my first, and I guess this will ask, oh, you know, I'll, I'll get back to the original question, but I, you made me think of another question I want to get to. First of all, like, you know, the first, you know, the first piece of music I ever bought on my own with my own money, I went to the store and I bought Peter Gabriel's single cassette for Sledgehammer. Oh, yeah. Um, do you remember the first uh, piece of music that you purchased yourself? I, I don't remember the first first one i do remember i got uh, a, an album for christmas once um because the the guy who gave it to me went to a record store said what do you recommend and they said this and it was a cassette the album it was donald fagan's the Nightfly," and um that changed my life forever <laughs> that album was uh, i listened to that album on a regular basis even today you know i think um, i've seen you post about that album if i'm not mistaken yeah, I think I have posted that on Facebook. And, yeah, um, that's a that's one of the big ones for me. You know, and we all have those albums, and you know, it's kind of surreal to think about. You know, your father. You know, so into so many people. You know, he was their life changing. You know, artistic piece. You know, whatever that may be, with an album, a song, uh, or whatever. But you know. You know, we're, I'm a fan of music. You're a fan of music. So many people, our listeners are. Music is just one of the joys of life. But you know, I also find interesting, and the only reason I bring this up is because there's only a handful, handful of people I can say this about. As far as celebrities go, you know, you watch on TV or you listen to interviews, and something about your father that fits into this category in my mind that is different than a lot of people who are in the spotlight is there's very few people that not only I can enjoy them singing, but I could listen to them speak for hours. There yeah. was something about your dad, like any interview that he did, any time he talked, like any, like it's just like I could just sit there and listen to him talk. I felt the same way about John Lennon. There's yeah. just something about hearing him speak. He not only the sound of his voice, but what he said. It was so intelligent and witty and off the cuff and it was just interesting do you understand does that make sense or no yeah no it totally does and i i actually miss that a lot about him because that was one of my favorite things was to talk with him and he loved to talk with people and i i miss the sound of his voice i really do um the fact that i can still hear his voice through songs is 
pretty amazing. I consider myself very lucky in that regard because not, not everyone gets to see pictures of their, their deceased parents and listen to their voice like that. Well, I think that, you know, you were blessed to have him as a father. And I think the world was blessed to have them, have him in so many ways that we got to have him through his artistic creativity. But, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in God and I'm a big believer in, you know, we'll see these loved ones again someday. And I'm a big believer in prayer. So I will tell you, Zach, that I will pray for you and your health situation. And I'll ask our listeners to do the same and just keep doing what you're doing because it seems like you're doing great, man. And I tell you what, I didn't know what to expect having an interview with Harry Nielsen's son, but I tell you what, you're every bit as impressive as your father. So I want to thank you for coming on. Oh, well, thank you. That's a, that's a very high compliment. I appreciate that. Well, hopefully we'll be able to talk to you soon again in the future. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Thank you.